Scotland's Ireland's beautiful mm -hmm. and, Scotland, and Scotland Scotland you've obviously been, you've been yep. a good few times been, as well I was trying to have the trying to understand what they were saying half the time in well, Edinburgh. This is, what, this is why I brought my translator with me when I go over, you know. He's worse than I am. Right, it's so yeah. funny. I, I is it, is this a, 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 a fantastic. See, you think you've just turned up to a normal interview, but you think, all right, I've got to try and understand a Scots person and an Irish girl with dreads. This is a nightmare. Well. Fantastic. You know? No, you guys are awesome. It, it's a... Uh, it's amazing though, because I went to the I went to the castle and I did the touristy <laughs> right. things, and um, and uh, it's a beautiful part of the world, by mm -hmm. the way. But I was asking directions, and I promise I didn't understand <laughs> a word anybody said. It was I, amazing. I, I can imagine because the thing is, as well, not only can you not understand us, but we don't know our way about our own country either. <laughs> so so we it's make like it a up. double whammy, you know. But, um, not okay. We are on the special video series of the Talk Music Podcast with the legendary Nathan East. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Great to have you here, Great to be here, yeah, awesome. So me and Tanya are obviously uh, delighted to speak to, to Nathan because um, I've heard so many stories about yourself, particularly about how you got discovered, so I'm, I'm so desperate to hear. Yeah, let's take us um, back to 16-year-old Nathan East. Oh, man, well... <laughs> a couple of years ago. Just a couple <laughs> yeah, a couple of years ago. No, that's a that's a fun story because um, a band I was in, and I was in a lot of bands in San Diego, but one called Power um, played at a, a Stax kind of review with Rufus Thomas and all these kind of uh, R&B acts, and Barry White was one of them. And he literally hired our band on the spot when he heard us to, to tour with him, you know, and I'm just like the 16-year-old guy, you know. And, you know, we were just little young puppies, and we, we were, you know, over the moon to get the, you know, like to get his tour, you know, next thing you know, national tour, Apollo Theater, Madison Square and Tuxedo, Love Unlimited Orchestra, and I'm, I'm going, <laughs> man, you know, this is kind of cool, I think I want to do this. <laughs> so that was, that was literally kind of my first taste of, of touring and playing arenas and, and I, I got bitten by the bug early on and it's, yeah, never looked back. So did you decide at that point, this is what I want to do, or was it like three or four years before that, I want to do music for a living, hopefully I'll get a break, or was it at that point in time? Well, I, I always felt like I loved music, you know, I, I, um, I was always attracted to whenever I heard some cool music, Charlie Brown, Christmas specials, I'd hear, oh, what's that cool piano, Vince Guaraldi in the background, or, or of course, you know, everybody when the Beatles and Stones, you know, you know, we all had our broomsticks imitating uh, <laughs> those guys, and, and when I picked up my first bass, actually in a church in, in San Diego uh, at about age 14, you know, it just was one of those things that felt like, you know, this is something I could do and I, I felt good about it. And, and then not only it's kind of the power you have when it's in your hand, I can't go anywhere without it, so you have to have it now even. So, no, no, but there's, there, I just felt this kind of love for it and, and then between that tour and I just say, you know, well, I might as well major in music and I went to college mm -hmm. and studied. and. And, and did everything. I said, well, if you're going to jump into it, do everything you can to prepare for whatever the challenges you're going to have to be faced with. So, you know, started, I even started a, a master's program, got my degree in music and, you know, learned what I thought I needed to learn to come up here to L.A. and, and see if I could make it in this big city. And you've certainly done that. So is that something you would recommend then to a lot of younger musicians? Particularly out here, you've got the Musicians Institute, and you would recommend going to college and, and going to university and getting that qualification? Or would you recommend, because a lot of people say you should just get out there and play, what's your take on it? Yeah, you know, I um, there's two schools of thought, but I'm, I'm always of the school of thought that just be armed with as much um, information and education as you can. So. I um, am a proponent of that. I have an online bass school, you know, NathanEastBass.com, where, where, basically, it's it's kind of like an online um, video exchange program. But, but at the same time, I'm not just teaching G7 and and academics, but I'm trying to impart a little bit of wisdom about what it takes to go on the road and. I mean, genius is half, half your genius is learning how to play, mm -hmm. and the other half, I think, is learning how to translate that into some value uh, so that you can go out into the world and, and make a living at this. It's real life. Yeah, yeah and the, the real life experience. So that's where, um, that's where, you know, the road education, that's where people kind of 
say, okay, I'm just going to give up everything and get in the van and start playing music on the yeah. road. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, look, the police, you know, a lot of people did that. And, yeah. um, but I, I do strongly recommend just having, you know, it's like a carpenter, have a lot of tools in your mm -hmm. toolbox. Mm -hmm. You never know what kind of project you're going to be yeah. working on. <laughs> when you got to L.A., then you started to get involved in writing. And you yeah. seen from the ground back in the day, the earlys of Madonna and all right. this before these guys were big stars. That must have been really exciting. Yeah, it gives you perspective on um, really there's no kind of magic bullet or there's no, I mean, even Madonna had to start somewhere, you exactly. know, and I remember... <laughs> I remember the very first Whitney Houston session, you know, where this girl comes in, nobody knew who Whitney Houston was. Um, and you knew that she could sing, and we're in there on the session, you know, and I'm saying, another girl that can sing, I hope hope it goes well for her, you know. Mm -hmm. But I've seen both sides where you, somebody comes in that can sing like that, and then you never hear another word from them, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, fortunately for Whitney, she came in there and, you know, it just, she shot up like, you know, like a star should, you know, mm -hmm. shooting star. And, and mm -hmm. but it was because um, I think everything was aligned for, for this person that had done their work and prepared. And then next thing you know, they matched her up with, okay, we're going to put you in this studio with all these top guys. And they're, everybody's going to uh, focus on making this a winner, you know. And then, so uh, here we are in the recording, saving all my love for you. And, and uh, songs like that, and, and the, you know, greatest love of all, and you know, okay, I hope for the best, and she did great, yeah. you know, and we miss her dearly. Absolutely. So, jumping back and forth, you're playing bass with Barry White. What comes after that? Then, what was the next, the next sort of big gig after that? Just the timeline. Of yeah. Well, well, Barry White was um, definitely early on. As a matter of fact, it was so early that I had. Um, I had taken off a little bit of school to to jump out and do that. So, <laughs> right, okay. so I went back and I finished. So you were still I, at school. When you were so I was still at away. school. Yeah, oh, when I got the call, I jumped back and uh, finished that. But um, even before I school was out, I got a call from John McLaughlin to go on tour. Um, I had done a, a clinic with Billy Cobham. Right. Yeah. And so we just uh, he needed a bass player, and they threw my name in the hat and went in there. We we jammed, and I was uh, Billy Cobham, and we did did the whole deal. And he um, he goes back and tells John McLaughlin, "Oh man, there's this bass player you gotta you gotta call." And I, I literally again, I thought it was one of my friends playing a joke on me. Hi, it's John McLaughlin. Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Put the phone down. Rings again. It's John McLaughlin. Really? Sorry. <laughs> you know? And he said, uh, "I heard from Billy Cobham. Can you go on tour with me? Uh, but we'd have to leave this Friday. Can you can you leave that soon? I had three weeks to go to finish my degree. Wow. Right. And." Um, so I asked everybody, all my friends, yo, you idiot, go, 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 you know. And the most important person to me, you know, I called because uh, my grandmother was one of the very close to her, and she said, if you don't do one thing for me in your whole life, finish school, you know. And so I finished the three weeks, and I passed on the tour with John, which was everybody thought I needed to have my head examined, you know. But I'm glad I finished. Um, I actually, you know, have met him over the years. He's great. Yeah. And... Uh, um, but it was one of those things I did, you know, the parents and my grandmother, especially when she made that request, I just said, okay, I'll have to listen to her and Absolutely. do it. Absolutely, what grandmother and says. Exactly. You know, <laughs> she's been around a lot longer than I have. Yeah. So, um, but um, luckily, fortunately enough, you know, calls were coming in. I, I got a call from Hubert Laws uh, um, shortly after to go on tour. Um, and play with him, so we played the Hollywood Bowl again. I'm saying, you know, one of my first big gigs. I'm at the Hollywood Bowl, you know. Um, and then, you know, people like Patrice Russian started put spreading my name around. And then, I still did records with Barry White. And and uh, next thing you know, is you know, there's a call from Kenny Loggins, Quincy Jones, Lee Rittenauer, oh, you know, and it's it's, it's crazy. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it was it literally, you know, like you just and and I moved to L.A because you wanted to be in the proximity of, of where these calls were, you know. Mm -hmm. What age were you when you made the jump and moved here? So I was, uh, I was probably almost 20, yeah. yeah, you know, and then, uh, and I literally just, you know, when I first got here, I, I uh, got a phone number and everything, and I used to call the phone company just to make sure the number worked, because it wasn't ringing for about six months, <laughs> you know, okay, it works, it works, but around, I have to say, around, uh, the top of the end of the 79, top of the 80s, it, it rang and never stopped. Wow. 
And, um, but I, I was, you know, I was making sure that if I do get the call, when I get there, I'm going to, I'm going to try to bring it as hard as I can, you know? Mm -hmm. So you, you got to leave something behind that they're going to be able to talk about and say, Hey, mm -hmm. you got to use this guy. You know? mm -hmm. And you know, if Quincy Jones is telling people, Hey, get Nate East, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's amazing to think that you've got, I mean, I've got all these images in my head still of you in a, a school uniform and then just going cha changing it in a tuxedo to play Madison Square Garden. It's, go it's the greatest Madison thing in the world. Square. And that's, that's actually what happened. It's brilliant. So we move on. Obviously, um, a lot of people know you from a lot of different acts that you've played with. Obviously, one that springs to mind is, is Eric Clapton. Yo, yeah. So how did that gig transpire? How did that come about? And you must have been so excited that the oh, thought man, no, Well, that's 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 another thing because you know when you're um, when you're 14 and you're in the room going like this, <laughs> or in the, the original key. I mean, and you got the black light posters of Cream and. There's Santana and Vanilla Fudge and all these kind of, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of, when I was a kid, you know, I'm learning these songs, so, you know, to get a call from a guy that, you know, one of your heroes like that was obviously, it was pretty exciting. He, uh, he was on the side of the stage at Live Aid when we, uh, when I played with Kenny Loggins, mm -hmm. and, and I come off and, and he's just going, man, that was awesome, and Dude, you want to go hang out? And I'm going, really? Eric Clapton, you know? He's a guy from the <laughs> exactly. He's like a guy from the Blacklight Post. He's a guy from Cream, and it was just so, it was so cool. He was, um, you know, he was just very reverent and, and respectful. And and then next thing you know, we're in the studio together, and then on tour together, and and then like brothers for the next two, three decades. Beautiful. Amazing. It's um, crazy. <laughs> one one of the things that really stands out to me, and I've been wanting to ask you this for years when Clapton, Tears in Heaven, to, to, to be able to play that song and, and do that and, and do the kind of justice that he does with it is, is I think it's just incredible. Right. Um, when he comes in with that song, um, if you can take us back to that time frame, what were your first thoughts when you heard the song? Were you, a, a, to what extent were you a part of that? Can you remember Right, that? well, obviously this was a, a you know, a very devastating time for for all of us. You know, because Connor was he was the sweetest little guy, four years old, and and um, you know, just you're not really ever prepared on how to handle something like that. Mm -hmm. So we, um, um, you know, obviously he wanted to be there for support for for Eric, and and he at that time, you know, he always had an acoustic guitar in his hand, and and I can remember hearing this kind of the, the riff for the song um, being kind of carved out and next thing you know it, it formed and he said let's go in and record it and um, it's almost like you know you don't play the song it plays you you, know, mm. you just go in there you're, you're holding your instrument but these notes are coming out of this emotion and um, I think that was about um, you know a very a very serious way to to get the healing process going for all of us but especially for Eric, who you know, who would have to, you know, really look this thing face on and and say how do you handle it, you know. So, the song to me it was it was almost like it was written a thousand years ago. When you hear that song, it's like so it 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 wrote itself, you know. And, and uh, so we were kind of messengers of, of the delivery. And it's not just a bunch of guys being session players. You're supporting this guy through this, and it's, right. it's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. It's not you don't. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's really it, it was it was a big family affair, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, um, all we were basically concerned with because I mean, you can't think of anything worse happening in your life, you know, and, and we were just concerned that we support and allow him to to uh, handle it and then but but help him through it as much as possible. One thing that you mentioned there about playing notes and playing ballads. One thing that Tanya was explaining earlier. Yeah, you were saying about playing ballads, and that's what we got talking about, Tears in Heaven. Oh, really? Yeah. When you play a ballad in a song with that much meaning in it, like, your delivery is just astonishing. Yeah, you know, it's, for me, I think I'm a, I'm a ballad player, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, 
I'm one of those kind of romantic guys that always, you know, even before I started playing, I was kind of drawn to, uh, you know, my, the first single I ever bought was uh, Nowhere Man by the Beatles. Wow. And, and then the next one was More Love by Smokey Robinson. So, you know, like I, I just gravitate toward, you know, these ballads. And I feel like in ballads, too, um, as opposed to, you know, music that's going by really quickly, you can savor each note, and each note, yeah. um, as you play a ballad, um, can be played with, uh, like, you just put everything into that one note. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of that kind of music. What's yeah, some of the favorite ballads that you've got a chance to record? Is there anything that's oh, man. To well, there's been a few. Uh, you know, the ones I mentioned by uh, Whitney, Saving All My Love For You, <laughs> and, and uh, The Greatest Love Of All. But um, it's funny, I look I look back, there was a song called um, Never Gonna Let You Go by Sergio Mendez. We just recorded it down the street from here, you know. Um, and then, you know, of course, um, it was when I was just, it was, you know, Tears in Heaven, of course, but um, songs like uh, Endless Love by mm -hmm. Diana Ross and, and Lionel Richie and, and Lady that he wrote for 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 Kenny. Just, I mean, there's there's a, a whole boatload of them that I've just been glad to be on. Through the Fire, Shaka Khan. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> and then, to skip forward, to change it completely off, Daft Punk. <laughs> oh, yeah. How did this come about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy too. And I mean, I just, I was, I got a call from these guys, and they were putting together, you know, a list of their session guys, and I, I, I'm thankful that I was on it, you know. And and they called, um, and we're in town for about, you know, a few weeks recording, and we went in there and did a batch of songs. And I think in that batch, Get Lucky was was one of the songs, but it wasn't really. I mean, that apparently that song's been in the works for about two years. Yeah. And um, so between the time we recorded that track, they had gone to New York and, and put Nile on it, and then Pharrell wrote the lyrics. And, and when it got back to me, um, here's Nile and, and all this fun, and it's a different song. We've we got to have another crack at the bass, you know. So mm -hmm. we, we went in and, and did a few, few more bass tracks, you know, and then next thing I know I couldn't get off the radio you just turn the radio on it's yeah on. literally and I mean my son we, he was laughing I came back uh, from tour and he said daddy watch this and turn on the radio there's get there lucky again. Yeah. and, and uh, it was exciting because and fortunately it's a song I really like you know? mm -hmm. Super hokey. Yeah. And your I mean, Grammy performance. Yeah, I was oh, going to say what was it like? <laughs> oh my god. Oh that was crazy. Cool. Yeah that was like uh, again surreal. I, I have to pinch myself half the time <laughs> for all this stuff. Okay, you, just imagine, like, the center of the musical universe where just from the stage you look at and there's, you know, Beyonce, there's Katy Perry, there's Ringo, Paul McCartney. I mean, just, I mean, <laughs> the industry was sitting out there in the front row and they're all what looking and do? dancing. Yeah. Not to mention 25,000 people from the very back of the Staples Center. You could just see people dancing. And uh, so it was. It was a. Uh, it was a good yeah. moment. <laughs> Some great shots of like Steven Tyler and Katy Perry. Steven you know, Tyler, people dancing yeah, around exactly. <laughs> and uh, you know, and giving high five. And for me, it was like, you know what? This is exactly what music is all about. Right. I mean, this it, is yeah. it. <clears throat> um, nothing else. It's yeah. it's it's not a judgmental thing. Mm -hmm. People aren't trying to be okay. We're cool. Or is this? They like it. The song only has four chord changes in it, yeah. <laughs> you know, which to me is genius too. You know, because it makes people happy. Yeah, that's it. and and people are uh, inspired and and happy, or whatever you know. And I mean, this thing made it. You know, the president heard the mm -hmm. song and was dancing to it. You mm -hmm. know, and then Stevie Wonder takes a verse. So. Stevie Wonder the takes a verse. Melts. Come on, <laughs> you know, and 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 he did it because he wanted to. Oh, can I sing a verse on this song? You know, so and take it away. Take it away, and who wouldn't who wouldn't want Stevie Wonder to sing? Oh, it? So I mean, um, that that to me was a moment where everything that uh, I always visualized about music came together in in a moment. You know, the five minutes of just pure, like, surreal uh, excitement and happiness, you know, just because of, of this thing that we do here, you know. 
It's amazing when we were preparing the questions for today. The questions were basically just a list of names. We'll need to ask him about this person. We'll need to ask him about that. One of them was was Michael Jackson. So tell us oh, about man. that. Oh man, yeah, Michael Jackson. Well, I mean, I think there will there'll never be. You know, it's like the, this is a one guy comes along in your lifetime, like mm-hmm. Michael Jackson, and even even in their life, you know, in the, in the family's lifetime, mm-hmm. they have to look at him. But this guy is very special, you know, and uh, just almost superhuman um, <laughs> in, in, in his delivery in his talent and his gift but you sit down and have a meal with him after the session and we're telling jokes and normal guy, normal guy yeah. just the sweetest guy you ever were and, and just he likes everything that you and I like just, mm-hmm. uh, but the world just focused on everything he did so whatever he said you get picked apart yeah. and it's almost like royalty or, or mm. uh, you know in, in politics where you know you got to watch everything you say and do and everything gets scrutinized and you can imagine to, to be in the studio with him you're making a record every note you play is going to be heard by millions of people guaranteed mm. you know so they better be good in the studio with him speaking up because a lot of people obviously just think of him as the singer the dancing performer right. but for you that played with him, you'll know, and as a lot of musicians know, how actually heavily involved he was with the bass line, with the drum part, with the keys. Everything. He could pretty nobody knows that he sits down and does. Oh that. yeah, no, he he, uh, and then you hear some of the ideas that he sang on the tape, you know, and so he says, oh, I got the you know, song that he's check it out. And, you know, he's got the bass line, and you know, everything's, in, everything's in his head. He's it was really, it was really um, something to see. Yeah. You know, it's inspiring to see somebody that's that prepared, and when they go in to record, they're they're ready to deliver. You know, yeah. and just listen. I mean, and not just once, not one hit. Just listen to everything he's done, even when he was a kid. And it's there's something very magical that um, the world was blessed to have this guy for Absolutely. 50 years or whatever. When you mentioned about being in the car or a song comes on that you've played on, that must happen to you quite a lot. <laughs> um, a couple you, times. <laughs> when you see all the different interviews with you and people saying, you know, Nathan East, Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, but we're interested to know, is there any records that you've played on that perhaps doesn't get mentioned? Or because you, you played on over 1500, but is there any you think to yourself, I'm surprised nobody talks about the fact that I played on such right. and such a record. Is there anything that springs to mind? Well, there, I mean, there are a lot of records actually that I've recorded in the studio that um, you thought, oh, well, I can't wait for the world to hear this. This is the most amazing thing ever. Mm-hmm. And then nothing, you know, and, and like... Going, did the record company miss this, or did what happened between the time we recorded this great music, and then and then it came out, you know, or mm-hmm. did it come out? And and I, I feel like it's funny because the music that gets talked about is only the music that gets uh, that gets played or whatever, you know. But yeah, there's especially in the um, instrumental world of music, you know, I've played with Wayne Shorter on some records that, you know, you play on the record, I never hear the song on the radio, you know, and, uh, but it's brilliant music, and, and that, that happens in a lot of um, cases just with the instrumental music, mm-hmm. um, because obviously people, you know, the, most of the population are listening want to hear some lyrics, you know, mm-hmm. and, but what happens is I think you then, I mean, I, I, I did a Bobby McFerrin album that I was very excited yeah. about you coming out. And I, again, you know, he had, you know, Don't Worry, Be Happy, which and the people wanted to try to turn him into a pop act. But he was, he was, you know, no, I'm an artist that does, you know, all kinds of different things. So mm-hmm. don't just pigeonhole me into one thing, you know. So, um, but then you hear, you know, you hear some of the stuff that does make it out and you think, oh, wow, how did that, how did that get airplay, you know? And uh, so I, I find it's just an interesting study. Our music, our instrumental music, like foreplay, we go to Japan and places like that in Asia, and they're all over it. And I think that's because since they don't understand English, they probably gravitate more toward instrumental music. Right, mm-hmm. just and really not, listening. Yeah, and so they're, they're really focusing, and so what, what we play becomes um, pretty much um, the the lyrics, you know. So, uh, and that makes us happy because there's a market for us over there, and and I've been to I just 
did my 67th trip to Japan. Wow. So, 67. <laughs> yeah, it was just with, with, I've done two this year already, one with, with uh, Eric Clapton, and then just came back with Toto, wow. and then I'm heading over with Foreplay, and then they want Nathan East to come later in the year, so there might be four trips to Japan <laughs> this year. <Wow. laughs> this brings us on really nicely. <laughs> Daft from Daft Punk to Daft Funk. <laughs> Daft okay. Funk, yeah. Now you've been kind enough to bring your bass on. Tell us about the solo album and of course that single. Oh yeah. Well, you know, it's it's just funny when, when you... Uh, Michael Thompson sent me a track, you know, and it was around the time Get Lucky was out and 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 he was saying, oh I got this track and it, it reminds me a little bit. Not really, but in a way like the Daft, Daft Punk kind of fun retro and that's when I thought okay two great guitarists Ray Parker Jr. and Mike Thompson on the same track you know and then just um, and then you know just go retro and don't worry about it just, just have fun you know and um, so we did that and then you know we kind of collaborated on it I added a little hook section in there and you know as a joke we called it Daft Funk <laughs> you know and, and uh it, it was just a fun, fun thing to do, and it came out after they won all the Grammys and everything. So I think that didn't hurt us at all. No. <laughs> and you had some great collaborations on that album. Oh man! Did yes, it's from Michael McDonald and all yeah. these incredible people. Well, again, these are my friends, and the album really is a celebration of, a friendship and music. Um, and you know, when you go to make an album, you're going, okay, what should I? What am I going to do? I'm a bass player, and <laughs> and, and obviously there's many approaches that a bass player can make you know because it's not necessarily a lead instrument but mm -hmm. we can definitely go lead and show you some chops and some mm -hmm. uh, and you know so there's a lot and and so i tried to be not too judgmental about what am i going to do and try not to be too fiddly about okay it has to be this has to be this but then just instead say you know what what are some of my favorite songs who are my buddies if I just made records with my buddies, there's there's ten albums right there, you know, for uh, for everybody that I called to play on this record, you know, there are ten more people that I didn't have a chance to play on it, yeah. you know. The guys were getting mad at me. It was definitely going to be part two then, right? <laughs> but, oh yeah, no, we we, we, we over recorded, so we have volume two is already in the there works now. Yeah, oh. and and but then you know I'm just thinking I've I've, I've known McDonald for thirty years, and we've uh, I've always He's one of my all-time favorite singers, so I mm -hmm. thought, you know, and when I call, yeah, let's do something, you know. And, you know, Stevie Wonder, we've been buds, and I played on his last record, and the song we played, we actually were fooling around with an arrangement of that, so he said, if you if you ever record that, overjoyed, you know, call me, you know. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how can you pass up an opportunity <laughs> like that? And and all, the, all these people are, uh, you know, Clapton. I mean, I can't do a record and not have Eric Clapton on it, mm. you know. <laughs> and so, uh, and everybody just said yes, and and it was lovely, you know. Um, and then it was a great. Sarah Bareilles even came in, and and you know, so one of my favorite Michael McDonald songs, one of my favorite singers, and it was so. I just kind of, without giving too much thought, you know, just started celebrating all my favorite music and people, and and lo and behold, you know got this gathering collection of songs and it turned out uh, to be something that I'm very proud of. Absolutely. I'm trying to think, um, I, I suppose it would be a good question and a quiz to, to ask <laughs> if there's anybody that you haven't played with. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to work so who out. Haven't you played with? <laughs> but is, is, is there any artist that you haven't had the chance to work with yet you think it'd be great to record or play live with? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, too, there, there are a couple of people that have passed on, like Miles Davis, that would have been fun, you know. I always. I always thought you know, Marcus Miller, then he did a great job, and I'm so fortunate to to spend that much time with with Miles Davis, who you know, the man of mystery and you know, great great artist. But um, you know, I haven't um, officially you know played anything with Pat Metheny, you know, oh, who I love, you know, um, Steely Dan. I love those guys, and they were you know, so that would be a bucket list type mm -hmm. thing. Um, James Taylor and I, oh, wow. we've done these little. Uh, you know, there's some beautiful events, ballads for you. But the, James <laughs> Taylor would be the guy, you know. And, and then um, Prince is a guy that I thought, you know, have never worked with. That would just be amazing to work yeah. with him. Mm -hmm. you know, sure, you will. You know, because can you imagine just 
getting inside of that brain that when he gets in the studio and makes those great records. Mm -hmm. See, when this goes out, you can imagine your phone's going to be open. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, it's Prince. Prince. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would have been nice. I've got Pat Metheny on the other line. I'll let you call you back. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, then there's people like the, you know, the chances of it happening would be very slim because, like, you two as a bass player, you know, but but uh, well, to play with those guys, yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You come over to Ireland, I'll <laughs> exactly. <that> for you. <laughs> I, I love those guys, and and uh, so you know, there's, you know, you have your dreams, but uh, but I have to say, you know, it's been it's been an amazing journey because mm -hmm. a lot of the people that I've ever wanted to play with, I, yeah, I had a chance yeah. to, and then um, for the new record, it was fun to incorporate some new and uh, fresh fresh talents I called my son who was 13 years old and, oh really and he um, he came and played on uh, the song yesterday so we did a bass what does he play yeah he plays piano yeah wow. he had a, he had a beautiful arrangement of it he was working on oh, wow. and we thought listen that should be on the record and he came and did a great job of it oh, what a fabulous thing to share with your son oh it's unbelievable That's beautiful yeah so so we've already done some concerts where he's come up and sat in and played it. Wow. Yeah, so it's amazing. He started younger than you then. <laughs> yeah, he started a little bit younger. And um, and so now it's just like, a, it's so much fun because now we're already halfway into making the second record and um, and then, you know, signing with an agent and getting some touring booked and everything like that. So it's it's like, wow, this has this got to be probably the best year of my life. No. Give us a shout when you're over in Scotland. Yeah. We'll do the Wallace Monument. A we'll pleasure. get a jam. Thank you. Huge thank pleasure. You so much yeah, for thanks. In. Thanks much. Can you give us some funky bass to play us out? Oh, man. You're asking the man. <laughs> Sort it out. Get this man a call. You too. Got a bit funkier. Cheers, guys. Thanks, me, man. Yeah.